Hi, welcome to Venture Scaler. I'm Sasha, three time head of people at Venture Back Startups. And I'm Jake, three times ops and growth leader from the Venture Back Startup circuit as well. And we're here dropping all of our best tips on how to scale your startup. Hello, thank you so much for joining us. I'd like everyone to welcome Julie to the show. Hi, Julie. <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> She's coming to us from Help Scout, and we're really excited to chat all things people ops or pops, as I like to call it, um, for the next hour or so. Yeah, super excited, Julie, to like get your perspective on how things are working at like Help Scout, like incredible startup, any of the past startups, I saw that you were at a company that got acquired by Squarespace and got to like work there for a little bit. So mm -hmm. really excited to hear about your journey and yeah, like the operational people side of everything you've been doing in the past. So let's dive right in. I'd love for you to set the scene. Tell us a little bit more about what your role entails at Help Scout. Yes, so I am the HR operations lead at Help Scout, and that entails many things. <laughs> um, every day is a, a little bit different, but largely, like I, I kind of say, I keep the lights on in, in HR land. <laughs> um, so there is a lot of sort of like the compliance pieces and the actual processes of, of getting things done. Um, but I also, you know, have a big hand in um, like compensation research, uh, performance management, career laddering sort of all of those things. So every day is a little bit different and, and I love it. That sounds amazing. Um, what are you most focused on in the, the last quarter? Or what have, what have been one of the key priorities for you? Yeah, one of the, I guess there's sort of like two things. So I'll, <laughs> one is I've, I've had my eye on a lot when we talk about processes, just starting to think about, is there a tool out there that can help us um, like with account provisioning, which sounds so boring, but <laughs> but as you can imagine, like when you're onboarding lots of people, it's literally like flip 50 switches, get all these things done. And there's just a lot of administrative work that has to happen usually pretty quickly. Um, and you have to like shelve everything else. So looking into a lot of tools like that. Um, and then also starting to think about um, uh, promotion processes for, for next year. Um, and, and hopefully beyond. So trying to button that up a little bit more and, and having managers start to think more um, into the future about you know, their folks and, and where they're going. So I definitely wanna hit on that in a little bit, like especially like the promotion piece because that's where I, I've seen personally and like with other folks that like, you know, at startup and startups, they, that they don't even think about that or they think yep. about it too late. And that's where like they, they hit this like really hard spot of people who've been in the company for a couple of years. They don't see that career path. You lose fantastic talent. You yep. just like, you, you hit a lot of friction. So I definitely want to touch on that. So Sasha, let's make a note. Um, let's start off just like way more high level. I'd love to just hear from your perspective uh, in, in like the people area, people ops, What's the most common mistake that you see folks in the people function making? Uh, this could be like at your own startup and past with mm -hmm. stories from your peers. Where do you see the common mistakes happening? Yeah, I, I wish I had a snappy answer. Like they always forget to submit this form or something like that. But when I think about and TPS reports, yes, <laughs> they're always missing something. Um, but from a, like a high level overview, I really think it's the biggest mistake is thinking that when you're in people ops, that you don't have to know about the business of whatever it is that you're in. It's sort of like, well, I work in people ops, so I'm all about, you know, performance and, and growth, which you are, but also I think not enough people ops folks lean in and really understand like business metrics. And that's advice that I would give to folks is buddy up with the head of marketing, buddy up with your, your CFO. And I feel really lucky. I report to the CFO in my current role. And it's like, it's like getting a, a mini business degree every single day and getting to work alongside her. And I have a business degree, but this is, this is actually way more, <laughs> way more real life than that one. Um, but just like understanding, you know, revenue goals. And I, I think having all of that information just helps you be a better partner to all the teams that you, that you work with. Yeah. That's interesting. I want to take a little little side path, and it's rare, I think, folks that I've talked to that you actually report into the CFO. 
So yes. how that happen? What's that like? <laughs> that, that is an interesting story. So when I came to Help Scout, so we have the people ops team, which is sort of like all the traditional functions you think about in people ops. Um, and they hired me and my title is, is HR operations. So it was really starting to like, look at, like I was saying before, the really operational, like payroll, like that sort of stuff. Um, so it made sense initially to have me report into the CFO, but I, I feel like I'm sort of like a double agent because <laughs> I spend a, a lot of time, like just as much time with the people ops folks as I do finance. And when I leave finance and go over to people ops, I'm sort of like bringing that lens of like, let's think about money and budgeting. And then when I come back to the finance meeting, I'm like, let's think about humans and their feelings. <laughs> Um, so it's kind of like this really nice connection between between both worlds. I like that a lot. I feel like yeah, that that's something that probably just should be happening more and more, like that that cross pollination between functions. That's really cool. Yeah. All right. So then, I mean, you're gonna have a like a pretty unique perspective here. So I'd love to like to know more about what are the people related things that keep you up at night over at, at Help Scout, like what are you, what are you thinking about? What's keeping you up? Yeah, and I think about, so we are a 100% distributed, fully remote company, even before COVID. That was before and before COVID, that, yes. that was the great decision <laughs> that your company made. Yeah, so that really didn't impact us <laughs> really a great deal, other than, you know, like folks like me, like my son is at home and anybody that's obviously dealing with sure. hard things. <laughs> um, <laughs> but in terms of, you know, just like what keeps me up at night, having people, so we have people in, 20 different states, 16-ish different countries around the world. Uh, it's really like employment law things that really, you know, make me nervous and make my heart sort of like thump a little bit. And sometimes when I'm talking to folks around the company about these things, like I'm interested in it. And sometimes they get sort of like glassy eyed. I'm like, no, this is, this is really important. Um, so, you know, especially, you know, going back to COVID like this year with the, the FFCRA, um, which if folks don't know what that is, there was a special part of that law that required employers to give, you know, paid leave to folks who were in the position where they had to care for kids who their, their school was closed or if they themselves had COVID. So just like being able to keep up with that stuff and we don't have an in-house lawyer. So to have an employment lawyer that we can call, um, I, I follow employment lawyers on Twitter, like real cool feed, uh, but just like figuring out like, oh, if some law changes in Massachusetts and I live here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, how do I, how do I figure that out? Yeah. Do you, oh, sorry. No, go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. That's Zoom cutoffs. Um, <laughs> do you guys currently still use JustWorks or have you pivoted off? We are still using JustWorks and they do send, which you probably know, like a monthly blast that's like, here's all the updates of things that have changed uh, around the country at least, which is, which is pretty right. helpful. But you have employees in 16 other countries, not just in the U.S. So <laughs> do you have any other resources like a, like a PEO or international lawyers? I, I don't even know what you would use for that. Yeah, so there is like the equivalent of an international PEO, like kind of like a JustWorks, but for the world. And that's actually another thing that I'm, I'm, I've started to vet some companies for um, 2021 to start to move in that direction. But yeah, that is one where it's sort of like when we hire somebody, especially if it's in a new country, uh, one thing is our bank has a list of countries that's like, hey, if you're wiring money to, you know, this country and you've never sent, like, why are you sending $10,000 to Ukraine? We're like, oh, <laughs> no big deal. So stuff <laughs> like that just sort of like comes up and you learn as you go on occasion. Wow. What advice would you give a company that is thinking about hiring internationally? Yeah, I think there is this big misconception out there that if you're a remote company, you can just hire from wherever, you just sign them up and they come on and it's, it's easy peasy. Um, I would say earlier on in the process, start to look at some of these international PEOs or sometimes they're called employers of record, uh, if you want to yeah. Google that. Uh, and so they can actually tell you like, hey, when you hire somebody in Germany, for example, like, here's the leave laws if they, you know, if somebody leaves and has a baby, or if you want to terminate somebody, countries are very different sometimes. You know, the concept of at-will employment in the United States doesn't really exist in, in other countries often. So it's like, <laughs> you have to have a good reason for letting somebody go. And so there's just a lot of things that like might not even occur to you uh, if you've only worked in the United States for your career. Wow. 
my mind is blown right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to switch back to the promotion path because um, I know that's such a huge focus for you, the career pathing, the promotion path, and given some of the performance and compensation piece as well. Uh, but what's the current methodology for promotions as it stands at Help Scout? Yes. So our philosophy is that you can be promoted basically at any time. So your manager has to make a case for you, essentially. Um, and even going back a step, I think, Jake, to your, your earlier point of like just thinking about promotions and like the grand scheme of things. So usually once a year, and then we'll have like mini pokes along the way, but we'll, we'll kind of ask all the, the VPs and, and managers and say, hey, look at your team. Just take a guess, your best guess of who's going to be promoted this year and around what month you think that's going to happen. And it's always going to be like, give or take, it'll move forward or back a little bit, or maybe one doesn't happen, or maybe one sneaks in, but best guess just for, for budgeting purposes. Um, and then what I'm doing now is every quarter, I'm pinging all of the managers and saying, okay, on deck for Q1, we have these three people. Is that still right? Or does somebody need to wait a little bit more? Or is somebody you know, ready in January versus March? Uh, so then we sort of look at the budget and it's like Tetris. We <laughs> move things around <laughs> and, and make it all kind of come out in the wash. Uh, but what they do is, so I have created um, career ladders so, and again, if that's new to folks listening, that's literally a document where it shows, okay, at this level, you are expected to do this thing. At the next level, you are expected to do this plus one or you know, have this extra uh, bit of respons responsibility. So that is what the manager will base their argument. I call it promotion court. <laughs> <laughs> it's, there's, there's no court, it's like so easy. But just to say, hey, I want them to you know, have you know, some sort of backup that like, yes, this person is ready to be promoted. Um, and it can happen, like I said, in any given month, like maybe we have five or six people being promoted, maybe the next month it, it's nobody. Right. Huh, that's so interesting. So then do you share the career ladders and all of that information with the individual so they know what they need to do or is that something only for the management team? It, uh, yes, it's for everybody. <laughs> so literally that's been like a project all year of actually getting the career ladders in place. So at the very beginning of the year, we created kind of like a generic one that it's like, okay, a mid-level human in any role at Help Scout should be able to do this. And it's things like quality and delivering results and your scope of impact. So whether you're an engineer or an accountant or a designer, it's sort of like you can use general enough terms um, to describe those things. And then throughout the year, each team has been taking that and then customizing it to their team. So then somebody in engineering who maybe they're a real go-getter individual contributor might say, hey, I want to look at the career ladder. And then they actually, it turns around. So they make the case to their manager sometimes and they say, I think I'm ready. And then it opens up this really nice two-way conversation. All right, so I'm, I'm curious. So, all right, so Help Scout was founded in, like, I think it was 2011 in my research. Uh, I know that you've been there for about, what was it, a year, year and a half? About a year and a half, just about. So you said that like the bigger part of this year, like that's, that's what the project you were going through, right? Yes. Like putting your, your ladders. What existed before that? And like, what, what prompted like the, oh, we really need to document how people progress. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So there were this concept of, of levels before. So we have levels one, two, three, four, five. And roughly that means like two is sort of like entry level three, mid, four, senior, five is like, you're like a senior leader at the company. Yep. Um, so those existed and just like that general concept existed in people's brains. And there was, you know, some words associated with those things. So it wasn't like nothing was, was around. Um, but truly, so whenever I started, one of the things I looked around and thought was, well, some managers are, you know, maybe really generous. And some are like, I don't know if this person is ready to move up because there's nothing like describing that. So that's where I really felt it was very important to take away um, or re reduce bias as much as we can and give actual employees, kind of what I was saying before, just have them feel a little bit more empowered about what is my career path? Um, because I'm sure, and you know, you've taken engagement surveys or you use an engagement survey tool. Uh, that's always something that comes up on that survey is people saying, I want to understand where it is I can go in my career here. Ah. With uh, the 
cross-functional visibility of all of these career paths, have you found many employees wanting to move laterally into other departments or it's like this role seems interesting and here's where I could slot in? That's been, yeah, that's come up and we've had it happen. You know, we actually had somebody like move from support into marketing um, or like from support into people app. So it's happened just sort of like naturally over the years. Um, but that's a question that's been coming up more and more. And folks are saying, well, what if I'm in this role and I want to move into like a junior developer role? Like what are the basic things that I would have to have in order to get there? And so I think we're not quite that sophisticated yet, but that's why I think it's so important to show like maybe you're a level three over here, but if you move, like maybe you would actually be like a level two over here. And here's what that means in, in that role. Interesting. Okay, cool. This is also fascinating. <laughs> um, so as far as compensation goes, what does your current structure look like for your pay bands? Because I know Help Scout's pretty transparent publicly with how they've structured their compensation and their yes. compensation philosophy. Yeah, so like I was saying, so we have this level one, two, three, four, five. And then within each of the levels, there's bands A, B, C, D, E. So it's literally like a five by five grid um, for each job family. So like engineering, marketing, finance, et cetera, et cetera. And each one of those points is an individual like discrete salary. So whenever we hire somebody, we'll say you're a three C and this is what that job pays. Uh, and that really helps us with reducing, we, we, we try not to negotiate. Um, so we kind of explain to folks when they say, okay, you made this offer, I want $2,000 more. So the discussion then is, well, we don't want to reward people who negotiate better than others. That's a, a big part of our philosophy. But then we can go back to and say, and here's why we slotted you in to this role base. I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but sound like based on the career ladders, <laughs> how they're defined, which is another reason why I said, hey, these are really important to have because this is how we make hiring decisions for people. Um, and one of the things that I want to avoid is having you know, somebody uh, in you know, maybe a high cost of living area because a big part of our philosophy also is we pay people the same no matter where they are in the world. And I can come back to that. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, maybe somebody comes in and they say, hey, I want this salary because that's what, you know, I think it is in my in my neighborhood. And somebody else might be like, no, for the same job, I want $20,000 more. So that's why we, we even explain people we've copied and pasted, like, here's our philosophy and here's why. And like 99 times out of 100, uh, the person says, cool, thanks for the information. And and it's fine. Hmm. Do you get much pushback? Like if they're able to see the career ladder, is there ever pushback? Like, Hey, given my experience, like point to specific things, like I would actually put myself at a 4D and how do you reconcile the difference? In, yeah. in it, it, it's funny. You know, we say we don't negotiate on salaries. Like we're not going to change a salary that we actually already use, but to your point, then somebody might say, okay, well then I'm more senior than the thing <laughs> that you said I was. And we typically, we haven't shared like an entire career ladder um, with, you know, applicants, but it, I mean, it's happened before. Sometimes we'll take a look and say, you know what, you know, you're right, or we're right. <laughs> um, other, I think another really interesting thing about this whole concept of you can get promoted anytime is it's not uncommon for people to come in and then move up a band within their first year. Sometimes people move up two bands within their first year. And I don't like to use that as like a lever to pull and say, but wait, like you can accept this salary and maybe three months from now, <laughs> it'll be this. Um, but it's, it's definitely possible. So interesting. I feel like compensation is one of the most complicated things to master if anyone's ever mastered it. Right. And I've always admired how Help Scout has been so transparent and, and buffer. And there are a couple others that have been super vocal about like, hey, we're trying this. We're transparent. We want our employees to know that we trust them and they should trust us. And like we're all figuring this out and making updates as things change. But it's one of the things that I think makes people the most emotional when you attach a dollar amount to yep. their worth. And like, I'm desperately trying to get right and figure out how to, how to do it right. But I don't think there's necessarily a right answer, but no. Yeah. And it's, you know, one of the other parts of our philosophy is, you know, with all these salary surveys that you purchase mm -hmm. or, or you can 
find for, for free if you scrounge around it <laughs> on the internet. So we use Payscale to do our, our salary research and you have to tie it to a location. Mm-hmm. Um, so even though we're you know distributed you know all over the place, we tie our salaries to Boston. Uh, and we, we picked Boston because as a company, and this was before my time, you know, it was decided like, hey, maybe we're not in a position to pay like San Francisco rates, like top 10%. But we can do Boston. Like that's not a sleeper city by any means when it comes to, to compensation. Um, and then we want to pay in the top 25th percentile based on similarly sized tech companies in, in that region. And, and even being able to share information like that with folks, they're like, oh, you're not just making this up. This is actually <laughs> like based on a thing <laughs> that you thought about. Really interesting. I like the idea of because I've I've worked at a company that had the same philosophy. It's like no matter if you're in you know, some, you know, nowhere town in you know the Southwest or you're living in San Francisco or New York City, you're, we're all getting paid the same based on role. Mm-hmm. It's interesting hearing about how you've anchored that. It's like, all right, we're, we're picking the top 25% for anyone living in the Boston area. So that might be really great for folks in like flyover states or, you know, wherever in not major cities and still probably kind of, you know, fairly competitive with folks living in, in major metro areas. And yeah. there's a basis behind it. I like that a lot. And does it mean we miss out on, you know, like great candidates in San Francisco sometimes? Sure. But there are wonderful people everywhere, which is, and since we have the luxury of being able to hire from pretty much anywhere, um, that's really exciting to know that we can find interesting people all around the world. Nice. So I feel like Help Scout's a, a little bit later stage than some of the other people, people, people that we talk to. Mm-hmm. Um, because I feel like people ops a lot of times is an afterthought or until something breaks or something is like horribly wrong, then they'll bring in someone to build the infrastructure where I think it should be very proactive. I think Help Scout was the same way, um, but then it, early on, it doesn't feel like compensation and performance and the infrastructure to take care of employee growth and the career pathing is a priority because it's chaos. Like right. there's so many other priorities. Why would we care about your growth? We're just trying to keep the lights on. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you think that deprioritizing performance and compensation and infrastructure, it's the word I'm married to today, um, but this infrastructure is a mistake. If it's, is it a mistake to put this on the back burner early stage, or do you think that smaller early stage companies should invest in this? I'm going to keep asking more questions. So sorry. <laughs> or do you think that it makes sense to wait until a later stage when you're more established? Do you think there's a point when you should, or should everyone do it really early yeah. on? I mean, and I, to your point, you know, when you're like a brand new startup and maybe it's a couple of co-founders, they're not like, hmm, what will our promotion cadence look like? And, and, you know, often, you know, maybe those folks, sometimes founders, you know, maybe they haven't worked at like a traditional company before and they don't even realize like that's a thing that right. they should think about, not dunking on anybody. <laughs> um, what I've seen happen most often is, you know, when a startup, you know, they hire their first few engineers and, you know, some designers and whatever. And it's sort of like, everybody comes in and you're a software engineer and you're this, and there's no concept of of leveling. Sometimes that is like a philosophical stance. I think that newer companies take like, we're all in it together. We're all the same. Um, And that holds up for about a year or two. (laughs) And then usually those folks start looking around and they're like, how do I move up? How do I get more money? Like, how do I show that I'm growing in my career here? So I don't think it's like a day one thing, like write out your career ladders and create your, your salary bands, but there should, I think it should come, you know, maybe once you have like four or five people in a role. So then when you start to think about like, okay, we've got all these people doing the same thing. Some of them are going to start to stand out uh, or move up and we'll, we'll need to hire a manager eventually. So to consider how all of those things will work. Um, a really good resource that I'd like to recommend um, is this website called progression.fyi. And mm-hmm. it's this like open source uh, career pathing uh, that a bunch of companies have published there. We don't have ours there yet because I feel like they're just not, <laughs> they're just not ready. But if you go there, like it's really well-known companies. I think like Buffer is on there. 
So if you're like, um, I'm starting from scratch, I don't know how to write a career ladder or think about how compensation should be tied to things, you can sort of start to, to grab bits and pieces um, off of that. That's perfect. You basically answered my next question. <laughs> like, what's the TLDR version of like, a solid yet not too robust performance and compensation philosophy a one or two person people ops team could deploy successfully to help their teams and help them scale without being too burdensome and feel like it's a drain on the business rather than a value add. So I'll just send everyone to progression. <laughs> and over and out. <laughs> but I can speak a little bit more to, to that point of like, okay, what should, what are the actual things that we yeah. can be doing? Yeah. Uh, because I've definitely been around, you know, I ran performance reviews for a company where it was, that was my full-time job. It was like, get it set up, launch it. It takes six months before people actually get their reports. And then it's time to set up the next cycle. And, and then people get their reviews and they're like, I did this six months ago. Like I am ready to be promoted to the next band <laughs> already beyond that. Um, and then other companies, and this is sort of like the, the way a lot of companies are going, they're just getting rid of performance reviews altogether. So what I really like and that we've been doing at Help Scout is we have twice a year, just like focused, uh, not performance reviews, they're more like career growth discussions. So mm -hmm. it's like sacred time that you know, okay, your people apps folks are going to ring the bell in like <laughs> November and June ish and say, hey, sit down with everybody on your team. Uh, we call them roadmaps. So we, we take this document where it says, what did I do the last six months? What did I think I was going to do? You know, this six months, what, you know, kind of slipped away. What do I want to do the next six months? So, and it's, you don't walk away with a rating like adequate or <laughs> meets expectations, uh, but it, at least it's a time that you can really sit down. And sometimes people say, I want to be in a banjo band, or, you know, I want to move on and do this other thing. Or they'll say, you know, in the next two years, I really want to be the director of this team. So it really starts to just shed light on where, where do people want to go in their career? That's really interesting. And that was actually like leading into the question I wanted to ask was more around performance philosophy. Mm -hmm. So we can take it from like Help Scout. You said that you actually ran this process with another company. What company was that that you ran the performance review process? Uh, it's, it's called Argo AI. Nice. What, let's just start, like, let's just take it a whole level higher, like overall, personally for you, what would you say is your own performance philosophy, having seen like all shades and colors of what this looks like? Yeah. Uh, so I really like, it's sort of like this, like, I don't know, layered approach. So I consider the one-on-ones that you have with your manager, whether they're weekly or every other week, that's part of it. So it's like, that again, is also sacred time that should be on your calendar. And that's like one of the first things I say when people onboard is your manager, they shouldn't be canceling your one-on-one. -on -one. You shouldn't be canceling your one-on-one -on -one regularly, like get to that meeting. That's, that's your time that you have. Even if you think you have nothing to talk about, whenever you get into the room or on the Zoom, oftentimes you can sit there and go on for, for quite a while. So, and that's opportunity every week for a manager to be giving just like really lightweight feedback. It's not like a barrage of like, here's a list of things, but maybe it's one thing you know, every week or so. Um, so I consider that to be part of it. And then also I, I really like what we're doing at Help Scout. So to have these two times a year, sort of like, it's not a review, it's not scary. It's not a slog that everybody dreads. Cause that's the other thing where whenever you're doing these really long drawn out processes, the company basically shuts down because everybody's writing reviews. You know, the really popular person is picked to do 27 peer reviews and they're like, I guess I'll stay up for the next four nights <laughs> writing these and they're all terrible. You don't want to be the 27th person that gets your review from that person. Um, so that, and then the third thing that I'll add to that is separating like a performance discussion from compensation. So I believe 100% yeah, compensation should you know, be reflective of your performance. But if you sit down, and I've had this before many times where it's like, it's review time and they read through the thing. I'm not listening. They're like Charlie Brown's teacher, I'm like get to the number, just read me whatever the rating is. And then that translates to there's your 3.7% increase. And you're like, thank you. <laughs> and you don't hear anything. You don't really care like what the, what the plans were. So if the compensation discussion is like, you know, totally separate of that whole thing. I think it, it lands a lot better. Nice. I like that. 
Um, that was what I wanted to get into, Sasha. You want to take uh, the next question? Yes. So I agree with you. I, I think that the there's tremendous value in the one-on-one and these frequent, I like the roadmap conversation, the career pathing. Um, but I found not necessarily at Trainual, but other places, it, it can be a time suck and a burden. And I think some leaders will be more excited about their team's growth than others. And it's like pulling teeth sometimes. Yeah. Um, so how do you balance this really important focus on employee development and career pathing, which I think directly feeds into retention with business objectives and ensuring that we're keeping the lights on and, and not like, overburdening either side of the equation? Yeah. So it's sort of, for me right now, I like that we can have this idea of you can move up and you can be promoted at any time. So it's like, you don't have to wait till June or November or December when that happens, uh, because that's where like the time suck happens where it's like, okay, everybody in the company is doing this thing all at once. And then like, I have to stop everything else I'm doing too. Like, okay, let's type in all these, (laughs) these changes um, into payroll. So I do think though, so we're at about a hundred people right now. Um, But on the other hand, every month it's like a little bit of work. So it's sort of like, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see like me, me six months from now or me a year from now, like how will I evolve this? And, and even just the idea of pinging folks quarterly to say, okay, let's lock in a quarter at a time. That's new before we were literally just doing, it's the 31st. Is anybody getting promoted tomorrow? Like, (laughs) let me know, just (laughs) send me a Slack. Um, which is not, not great either. Uh, um, but another part of that, that I, I think about too, is just this idea of, you know, you talked about balancing it with just the, the company needs. So something else you see, I think is this idea of you have to continually be promoted to feel like you're doing a good job. And I know we've been talking about promotions a lot <laughs> in this call, but we also really have a philosophy that like, you shouldn't expect to get promoted every single year. Like maybe sometimes several years will go by and you're cool just like hanging out at the level that you're at. Um, And then also having dual career paths. So the individual contributor and the manager path, because there's often times where the only way to move up is to move into management. And the person's like, I hate this. This isn't what I wanted, but I guess I'll do it because that's the thing that makes sense. Um, And that's when, you know, you lose people or you realize, oh, that was actually not what we wanted to do as a business. Right. Can we pause there for a second? Because I think this is a super interesting point, Uh, especially like from my perspective as like, I'm, you know, been like a people manager for like a while on the operation side of businesses. It's that I have lots of conversations with my team and they see that one ladder, the, okay, I want to be that supervisor, that people manager, the director, I want your job, which is fine. You know, yeah, like, and you're like, well, I'm going to be here for a little while longer. So <laughs> like, totally great. I'll help you level up. But I like so often I have, I, I sit down and have the actual conversation with them and realize you don't want to do people management or they like, they just equate it to like, I'm going to have to babysit as mm-hmm. like the word I keep on hearing. Like, I, I want to be a babysitter of people. I want to keep on doing what I'm doing, but I still want that promotion. How have you gone about like at this company, at other ones, creating that, that I see that individual contributor path. So I feel like that's the thing that gets overlooked the most when it comes to career project, like career progression at, especially at startups. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, that's, that's been part of the conversation this year of talking to folks because Right now, so we have, like I had said, like levels one, two, three, four, five. There's some people that have, you know, been around at the company for, you know, five, six years, like they're getting up there and it's like, well, you know, what's, what's next for them? And just really starting to think more about, okay, if they were to move up, what are the responsibilities of like a principal software engineer? And we don't even really use that title internally, but just to start to think about like, it's not just about like, okay, they've been here another year. They're, they're still great. Let's move them up. Like there has to be a, another thing <laughs> that, you know, that they can demonstrate that they do. So we've been thinking about that and really also kind of setting the stage. Uh, like I mentioned earlier that it might take a while. Like once you get to those upper levels, like you might sit there for two, three, four years before the next, the next level up comes. Um, and as you're talking about folks saying, I want your job, you know, I want to be a manager. 
And then I can't tell you how many times people end up there and they're like, oh no, this is a completely different job. I, and I still want to do my IC work and no, you can't do both. And they just sort of like flop around for a little bit till somebody comes in and says, stop doing that other thing. <laughs> you got to be all in on, on manager stuff. Um, you mentioned you know, earlier, what keeps me up at night. I think it's actually like tossing people into management jobs without giving them any sort of training. So it's just sort of like, here you go. It'd be like putting me in like a product designer role. I'd be like, uh, okay, I guess I'll just start doing this now. <laughs> what kind of resources would you recommend uh, an early stage team gives to a first time manager to help them level up or to help them be successful? Ooh, yeah, I, I have I have specific books and websites um, and things that I, I recommend pretty regularly. Uh, one of them is um, Laura Hogan. Uh, she was a uh, VP of engineering. I, I think, yeah, you all probably know who she is, but from at a couple of companies and now she just does full-time, uh, not just, but she does full-time management training. Um, so I took, she has an online class. Uh, I think her website is called wherewithal, but if you look up Laura Hogan, uh, you can find that it's, and it's excellent. It's very actionable. It's like how to give feedback, how to set expectations with your team. Um, she also has a, a book, um, Camille Fournier, who is the CTO at Rent the Runway. She has a really good book called The Manager's Path, uh, which is, it's very specific to tech companies and sort of like software engineering. Uh, but it, it, I think it's you know, applicable to kind of any manager. And it's like, okay, you're managing one person. Here's what that means. Now you're managing a team. Now you're a director. Now you're a VP. And it, it kind of goes through all of the, the, the different levels. Um, and I think internally, you know, once you get to a certain size, there should be somebody that's at least doing the nuts and bolts of how we manage at this company. So today you're a manager. This means you should be carving out time twice a year for those roadmap discussions. And here's how you have performance, you know, improvement plan discussions with folks. So actually have somebody like show them like, uh, we have like a coaching handbook that it says, here's all the things that mm -hmm. you will now need to do that maybe you just thought sort of magically happened. <laughs> oh, very cool. So you, your team designed its own internal coaching handbook. Was that like borrowed from other places or did it's like, did a team or a person like sit down and actually write what that looks like at Help Scout? Yeah, there were yeah, several humans. Yeah, they actually sat down and wrote it out. And I'm sure there was like inspiration, but it's, it's literally a document that we have in our wiki that is, it kind of goes through lots of different things, including um, just like, you know, how to think about your own time as a manager and like how to like keep your, keep your head on straight. <laughs> so it's not just about how do I fill out the form to get the, the thing done? It's, you know, more about the actual holistic view of, of managing. Very I love that. Yeah. Woo, that little <laughs> Zoom sound. Uh, we have one in our triennial account, quick plug. Um, and it's fantastic to be like we're going to have some some new managers this year and be able to say like, yes I'll be working with you every month to help you get up to speed but we also have static content that you can view and reference back to and all the best practices is huge uh, I think that's something that people overlook is early stage startups tend to hire more junior folks and promote promote new managers into management roles and don't give them much guidance because there's no time exactly. And and I'm a big believer that people leave managers and not teams most of the time. And so if you have a manager that doesn't know what they're doing or is a crappy manager, then <laughs> you're going to see a lot of attrition and maybe unneeded or unnecessary. Right. One of the other things that I, I just remembered that we also do is we, we call them coach chats. So once a month we have, it's like totally voluntary, but coaches, we, so we call our managers coaches. Uh, at Help Scout, which at, at first, I, I it was so difficult for me to get on board with saying it. And every time I said it, I was like, ah. but now like, it's, it seems so natural. And to me, it's like, that is what a manager does. They, they coach you. And it really, I think, helps also figure out what it is you're supposed to do all day as a manager. Like, no, you're not doing IC work. Like you are, you're coaching the people. Um, but anyway, so we have these chats and there, there's usually a topic where they'll come in and say, let's talk about X, Y, and Z or a book that we all read this week. So it's a really good way just to get people together um, and, and sharing amongst you know, each other. And it's not like somebody's job to be, I'm the trainer. It's just them, you know, chatting. 
Oh, that's cool. Do you have like in like your own employees or coaches come in and have those talks or do you have external people that are, might be experts in the field to come in and talk? Oh, it's just been internal so far, but that, yeah, that's actually a good idea to have some, <laughs> some external folks come in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Sasha, last question. Yeah, let's, let's wrap it up. All right. So this is uh, last question. We want to hear like your advice. So one piece of advice that you would give to an early stage people ops head of or someone on the team, uh, like that person looking to build a team and scale a culture, which is always like the, the tricky part with, uh, with these early stage companies. So what's that one piece of advice that you'd give the people like in your shoes years ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I started this a little bit too late in the game, but I would say network with other people ops folks, which is exactly how, how I met Sasha. So just <laughs> talk to other people because working in people ops at a startup can often be very lonely because usually it's just you or maybe like you and one other person for a really long time. And it's hard to, yes, you're emphatically nodding your head. <laughs> so lonely. <laughs> and you can't like vent with, you know, a fellow manager and be like, boy, this person really stinks. Like that's totally inappropriate. So to have like, you know, this buddy system of people that you can go to and say, hey, like, I know that you did this program last year. How did that go? Did you like that tool? Or like my sister, she works in human resources, which is odd. Like we both just sort of happened into the field. Um, she's in a very different industry, but like we'll trade stories and I'll be like, whoa, like I can't believe that that's happening over there. And just to get different perspectives uh, from people in, in different companies. And especially with, you know, Zoom, like it's so easy, literally reach out to LinkedIn and be like, hey, want to set up a 10 minute coffee chat? And most people are excited to do that. I'm in like 47 different people ops Slack groups. I don't participate in all of them, but it's a really good place too to just bounce in like, hey, I'm trying to buy this thing. What do you all think about it? And everybody's like, no, run away or, or yay, definitely. That's the one you want. That is Very such cool. good advice. I think that's something that I also wish I would have done earlier in my career because it is so freaking lonely. <laughs> And, and some of the, some of the stuff that you're dealing with is really heavy. Yeah. Like maybe like ending someone's employment and like, I'll sit and cry at home when that happens. Like it, it happens. And it's so sad because you like go through all the feels of what they're feeling and try to make the experiences as good as possible. And like in that crappy situation, but it's super, super lonely, but I, I think it's exciting when you're able to build a team, I think help scouts at a fun stage because you do have a team on the finance and the people side. Yeah, and have a, a group that you can bounce ideas off of and build really cool programs and do things to really impact your teams, which is amazing. And you're not so lonely and just right. want to cry all the time. <laughs> to be clear, I do not well, cry tears. I, I mean, it makes myself sound a little more emotional than I maybe can. <laughs> In a year. <laughs> I love my job. <laughs> I love what I do. Uh, you know what my other, I have like kind of like a silly piece of advice would be learn Excel or Google Sheets because people apps is like just like ripe with data and like learning to write like a really nice if statement or do some conditional formatting is going <laughs> to save you so much time and you know I have somebody on my team I'm like let me show you this cool if statement I wrote today I'm so <laughs> proud but that's like literally my job is spreadsheets that's kind of what I what I do all day and finance will be so impressed with you exactly <laughs> Oh, I love that advice. I'm the guy on my team. Usually it was like, I'm um, showing people like, Hey, you could just do this like really quick. If nested statement and get exactly what you need done. Mm -hmm. So awesome. Jake is my guy that I use for that. <laughs> yeah. I've outsourced. Everyone has an Excel guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, any last minute questions, comments for us, Julie, if not, we can let you go and get the rest of your day back. Ah. Uh. I don't think so. This is really fun. So I know it's I've been nice talking. for me to like think too about like with the questions like, oh yeah, like I do stuff or like just <laughs> to really think differently about the way that I approach things when I actually sit down and, and write it down. It's nice to get out of the minutia of the day to day and think like, why am I doing these things and right. the impact of everything that you're doing. 
super fascinating. I'm going to have to like go through this video a couple times and like jot down like the websites you talked about, the books you talked about, some of like the ideas that you had around programs you run at Help Scout. Like really, really interesting stuff that I like some of it I haven't like even, you know, heard of from other companies before. So yeah, really appreciate it. Cool. Hey you, thanks for listening to Venture Scaler. If you liked what you heard, please be sure to give us a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button below so you never miss an episode. The show is also available on all podcast platforms so you can find it anywhere you wanna listen. And if you found the information helpful, share it with a friend, family member, or anyone else that you think could benefit. You're also welcome to connect with us on LinkedIn. I'm Sasha Robinson, and that's Jake Huber. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.